behalf of CME Outfitters, I'd like to welcome you all and thank you for joining us today for this educational activity entitled Stopping Pain in Its Tracks, Optimizing Acute Migraine Therapy. Today's program is supported by an educational grant from AbbVie Incorporated and Biohaven Pharmaceuticals. Today's activity is brought to you by CME Outfitters, an award-winning joint accredited provider of continuing education for clinicians worldwide. I also want to encourage everyone to join us today on our live Twitter conversation at CME Outfitters. We will be monitoring the Twitter feed and we will be responding to your tweets as they come in. One last item I want to note is that we are using an enhanced platform today. This is gonna allow you to save slides, take notes on slides, answer polling questions, and also send us some questions. Please look at the tabs on the left of your screen and give us your feedback on the program and the platform as well. So once again, in case you've forgotten the last few seconds, my name is Dr. Jessica Ilani. I'm the director of the MedStar Georgetown Headache Center, Vice Co-Chair of Strategic Planning in Neurology and Professor of Clinical Neurology at MedStar Georgetown University Hospital located in Washington, DC. I have the pleasure now of introducing my esteemed co-hosts here and my good friends. First, I have Dr. Peter Godsby, who is a Professor of Neurology at the University of California, Los Angeles in Los Angeles, California, and also Professor at King's College in London, England. Welcome, Peter. Ah, Peter, you've been zoom bombed by being yeah, on. I, yes, I understand. <laughs> I thought I should start in the formal in the formal Zoom way. <laughs> thanks, for, thanks for asking me to be here. Excellent, you're starting us already in such a great mood. Yeah, well, yes. <laughs> we've got eleven things. And also, I'd like to welcome Dr. Gretchen Teachin, who's the Distinguished University Professor Emirata of Neurology at the University of Toledo College of Medicine and Life Sciences in Toledo, Ohio. Thank you for joining us, Gretchen, tonight. Oh, thank you for having me. I'm looking forward to it. So let's get us started on the first learning objective for today's activity, which is to develop strategies to address the challenges in acute management of migraine. So let's begin by asking you all a polling question. You should be seeing the question on your screen and you can vote now. The question is, what is correct about the CGRP receptor uh, antagonist GPANT class of agents in migraine? Is it A, dizziness is one of the prominent side effects. B, they are metabolized primarily, primarily by the kidneys. C, they are not contraindicated in patients with vascular disease. D, they should be avoided in patients with contraindications to tryptans. Or E, I'm not sure. Please vote now. It's a good clinically relevant question, this, I think, Jessica. Yes, I, I definitely agree. I was waiting to see if we get some of these survey responses. Yes, yeah, so I thought we'd say something beforehand. <laughs> um, okay, uh, so actually this is a different survey response, but um, why don't we actually take a jab at, at answering the question ourselves, um, Gretchen and Peter, if you want to join me here, and, and let's talk about CGRP receptor antagonist GPANs. Um, what do you guys think is probably the most prominent side effect that we see? Uh, we know that uh, GPANs tend to be really well tolerated. Uh, so I don't know, have either of you seen or know about dizziness being a potential side effect? or contraindications um, with these medication classes? 
Well, I believe it can be a potential side effect that someone can have, but I don't know that it was much higher than what you would see in the placebo in the studies. So it wouldn't be real prominent. I think something like nausea would be more prominent uh, with g as with most medications. So that probably wouldn't be one that I would choose uh, out of this group. Yeah, completely right. agree. One of the complexities is that things that are reported as side effects are very often part of the attack. That's why they're no different from placebo and dizziness is, people say dizziness a lot. They, you know, they mean lightheadedness, they mean vertigo. But that is a very common thing with a migraine attack. And very often our dr- the drugs are blamed. Not the drugs are innocent, of course, but they're, they're blamed for things that are part, part of the attack. So I agree with yeah. Gretchen, it's nausea. And the metabolism thing, just to move to that one, is um, well, that's about it's in it's liver metabolized these drugs, so that's that's not a thing. Right. So the correct answer for that case was that there um, are not contraindicated in patients with vascular disease, and that's what can make them very exciting to use as a new category of medication. So let's actually talk. Can about- I just say I, don't, I, I think also we're not saying to the audience that it's carte blanche just to throw them around on every uh, on on. On the, mo- on the worst vascular path you can find. It, it's, it's just the, the well. I mean, yes, absolutely. This is a very good point. Very it, good point. It, we're saying they're broad, it's, it's a broad safety thing, but it never replaces good sense in taking a decent history and knowing the rest of the medicine, I think. Yes, absolutely. Great point, Peter. So let's move to our first case. And Gretchen, why don't you go through this case? And this is a very typical case, I would think. Yes, it is. So the patient that we have before us is Laura, who's 29 years old. And since her teens, she's had a diagnosis of migraine with aura. And um, she's having currently about eight days of migraine per month, uh, which she's been treating predominantly with ibuprofen. Uh, She's able to work outside the home. She's a realtor. Um, And one of the reasons that she's coming in, you know, to the visit is that she is considering pregnancy and she would like a more effective medication than ibuprofen. She had been on oral contraceptives, but it stopped those six months ago in anticipation um, of, you know, trying to become pregnant and hadn't really noticed a lot of change in her, in her headache frequency. Yeah, so I think this is a pretty typical case. And as I said before, so we're going to think about treatment options before we start to discuss treatment options. I thought this would be a good opportunity to give that survey a try one more time. But to ask all of you, what do you think about a good treatment option might be for someone like Laura? So what would be your first line treatment choice for acute migraine in our patient, Laura? Would you choose butabitol, sumatriptan, on a botulinum toxin A, amitriptyline, or are you unsure? Please vote now. All right, so Peter, what do you think about these responses? Um. Looking at the responses, I think that the well, it's complex. The first two, thing to say is that it's a bit of a it's a sort of a bit of a low um, a low ball question in the sense that amitriptyline and nonbotulinum toxin type A just aren't useful. Uh, they're not uh, acute treatments, and it leaves you with it's reasonable not to be sure that that's a reasonable thing to say because here's a young young woman with t- typical migraine who's obviously not not greatly happy with a non steroidal and thinking about pregnancy and you know. I think whenever a, a woman sits down and says to me that they're thinking about pregnancy, I'm not exactly sure what to do next either, uh, because you, you've got to really sort of flesh out what they're thinking and how, you know, where they are in that journey, what their partner thinks, what do the, what's the sort of, what does risk really mean? Because it's, I can quote them the risks, which are negligible for sumatriptan, which I think is the best choice here. But that doesn't mean that the individual, you don't know what the individual's like. You know, they may have had some birth out mal- uh, problem with their sister or in the family. So they're uber concerned about it. Or maybe they're not concerned at all. I think, so I think it's tricky. And so it's reasonable to say, I'm not sure, because 
There's no perfect answer here. I think uh, butalbital is a bad, would be the not perfect answer. <laughs> and sumatriptan, the one thing for the triptans is we have a lot of good data from the pregnancy registries, particularly the Norwegians have done, the sumatriptan, narrotriptan pregnancy register. And while there's never enough data, over the last 30 years, nothing, no problems emerged with, uh, pre uh, in pregnancy using sumatriptan. So it's a, it's a good choice with an appropriate conversation with the person who's going to have it. Yeah, one of the things that I'd like to add is that, you know, sometimes when people are trying to get pregnant, it can take months and months or longer. And, you know, they want to know what's the safest thing to do during that period of time. And, you know, I oftentimes recommend that from, you know, the beginning of the menstrual cycle to day 14, when they're not likely to be pregnant, to, you know, feel free to use a medication like sumatriptan if they have reservations about using any medications at all. And then for the last half of the cycle, when there's a possibility of pregnancy to use something like acetaminophen or whatever. But during pregnancy, when you think about it, you know, comparing it to something like butalbital, both were in the now defunct FDA classification C, you know, for use during pregnancy, but the level of evidence for sumatriptan being effective in migraine is so much higher than for butalbital. And as uh, Dr. Goatsby had said, the, um, there's a lot of safety data during pregnancy for sumatriptan. So uh, that would be one medication I would definitely consider using for an acute attack during pregnancy if other, you know, uh, other remedies had failed. I think these are excellent points and important conversations to have with our patients that are women considering pregnancy, not to let them think that there's absolutely nothing they can do because we shouldn't forget that migraine can be extremely crippling and dangerous of its own to women who are having severe attacks while pregnant, nauseous, vomiting, bedridden, sometimes for days on end. Uh, this has to be a risk benefit ratio conversation. And I definitely feel like over time with more and more registry information as has been mentioned, I think many of our comfort levels with things like sumatriptan has increased. So Gretchen, I thought it'd be nice if you talk to us a little bit about the burden of migraine as we all have a good understanding that those with migraine can really struggle with this disease process itself. But what, what about the burden of disease on our economy and on the patient itself? Well, migraine is an expensive condition to have, uh, you know, health-wise. The cost from a study that uh, was published in 2017 showed that the direct cost for health-related, uh, you know, costs in migraine was over $9 billion per year in the United States, and that did not factor in the costs, the indirect costs of, you know, lost time at work or going to work but being less productive than usual, nor did it, you know, factor in that there's, when you have migraine, you are also at risk of other conditions uh, that we know are comorbid with it, like anxiety, depression, um, having trouble sleeping, uh, increased risk of stroke, and even myocardial infarction, and also epilepsy. And as our patient has asthma, that could also have costs economically, you know, for the economy. Um, and they can also, you know, make people uh, out of work for longer periods of time. And these are important to just be aware of since most of the people that are getting migraine are in their most productive years from a work point of view and, you know, their societal contribution. So that is something that, you know, there's a really big toll from this condition. So since migraine is such a disabling condition and has such a big toll, Peter, why don't you talk to us about how we can start treatment in patients with migraine, focusing on acute treatment? So the, the, the goals, well, what, am I, what am I trying to do? Well, well, I think everything's about restoring function. It's not the end point that's used in registration studies, but I, I'm really interested in getting people the days back that they're losing. You know, they say that migraine doesn't kill anybody, but it certainly, wrecks, it certainly robs them of time in, uh, in their life and they don't get a free pass later on. So I'm keen to make them as functional as possible, which is the combination of um, as relief from symptoms, 
pain and associated symptoms. The, um, I want them to use, I, I don't want them to feel that they need to be worried that they're going to need a rescue or some other thing's going to happen. I really would like them to be able to treat and go on uh, with their day. I want them to be, I want them to, to be in charge of the disorder so they don't have to go to um, an ED. I mean, the worst thing you can do with migraine is go to a place that's noisy and has bright lights and sometimes malodorous and people move you about. I mean, that's like the cardinal symptoms that will come to the di diagnosis. So, and there's nothing an ED can really do for you that we shouldn't be able to give patients to be able to do at home. We want to avoid unnecessary imaging and all the things that are happening. And I want them good tolerability. So I think that's how you balance that along, of course, with the problem of uh, of costs and having that discussion with patients is the kind of discussion I like to have. What's happened in the past? What side effects have you have? Um, what what are, what are your concerns? So I can so I can try and match the therapy. We have the range of therapies. So we can match the therapy with the person's problem. So before we can actually start treatment on a patient, we do have to be able to make an accurate diagnosis. So Peter, how do we as clinicians make an accurate diagnosis of migraine, both with and without aura? And are there particular criteria, hint, hint, I'm showing you a slide here, yeah. that we use in clinical practice? Well, yes, you're showing the uh, International Classification of Headache Disorders in its uh, third edition published in 2018. And they offer, I think, a, a very reasonable guide to the kind of questions you have to address in history. So how do we make the diagnosis? You take a proper history. And that's part of the, I think it's part of the whole therapeutic process. They have someone understand they're actually interested in what's going on and you're interested in their, their symptoms. And when you talk about aura, you're interested in the, um, in the way, it de in the development, the march up the arm or the march of the, vis uh, of the visual change. And the, that's what these uh, aura criteria you're describing and they're a little um they're a little verbose i mean it's hard not to hard not to admit that but they, they underlie the principle that we're looking for particularly visual 90 percent of aura is going to be visual and, and then somatosensory and um after those the the, the rarer forms um are which are, i think if you think you're seeing ret retinal migraine you ought to refer that straight away because you probably i mean that's extremely rare and then, of course, the length of the the length of the aura, those criteria that are mentioned. I think the main thing about aura for me that to take out of those criteria is the progress. Nothing progresses quite slowly and marches up an arm like a migraine aura. So the careful history, and then I think we're going to go in the next slide, if I'm correct. Yes, um, to migraine without aura, which is the majority um, of patients, maybe seventy percent. Depends a little bit on the age group. I mean. IHS wants you to have five attacks. I'd be happy if you if you had less than five, but you know, for a lifetime, that's not complex. So these are attacks with typical pain symptoms, one-sided, um, pulsating, severe pain, and the aggravation uh, with with movement, and then nausea, light and sound sensitivity, the the, the core symptoms that uh, you need to we need to get out of uh, people when we take in history. It's uh, they look a little bit, um, it looks a little bit arduous at some level, but asking, asking particularly about the migraine without aura symptoms is, it's pretty much bread and butter, I think. Yeah, it, it is bread and butter. I feel as a headache specialist, it's very much the meat of what we do every day. And it's in the back of our heads every day. Sure. It's like a checkbox, sure. right? But it's a little bit cumbersome if you're in general practice or your primary care provider. So there are a little bit easier methods that are based yes. on these criteria to um, really get about to meeting these diagnostic criteria. And one easy one that I like to talk a lot about to my residents and medical students is one called ID Migraine. It's a screener test. Uh, ID Migraine is a, is a screening tool and it's three simple questions. It's asking about these associated symptoms and impairment related to the migraine attacks. It's photophobia, uh, eyes for impairment and for nausea called PIN, the diagnosis. 
Photophobia, the question is, do lights tend to bother you when you have a headache? Impairment, eye, do you feel uh, impaired or avoid activities when you have a headache? And N for nausea, do you feel nauseous when you have a headache? I will often ask if they're like, I don't know what you mean by nausea, I don't throw up. I ask, do you feel queasy? Do you wanna avoid foods? Does your stomach get a little upset? Because sometimes patients automatically equate nausea with vomiting. If the patient says yes to two out of three of these, there's a very high chance that it's migraine. And then we can just delve more into the history itself. Now that we have a better understanding about how we have diagnostic criteria and how we can really start to make this diagnosis of migraine, let's get a little bit into treatment options that we have, what has been studied, um, where we are with consensus and guidelines. So Gretchen, can you take us through some of the evidence for acute treatment options for migraine? Yes, on this slide, we have um, the medications that have either established efficacy or probable efficacy. So you could look at that as sort of level A and level B. And uh, meaning that for any one person, you know, these are reasonable options, all things being equal. But we also have it divided then under each, you know, efficacy level as far as whether the drug is migraine specific, meaning designed for migraine or a non-specific drug that may be effective or probably effective for treating migraine. So under the migraine specific so with established efficacy, those would be certainly ones that we'd wanna um, see about trying one from that category. There are the triptans, which uh, we've discussed a little bit. Um, there's ergot derivatives such as DHE, intranasal. Um, there's the G-pants, the CGR, P, um, um, small molecule blockers, and then lismitidan, uh, which is also one of the newer groups that we'll talk about a little bit more with regards to what targets those are hitting. The nonspecific ones are familiar to us all with regards to aspirin and diclofenac, ibuprofen, which our patient had been taking, and also naproxen. But then there's a new one, the uh, Celecoxib oral solution that's um, now been approved and available. And then there's the old standby of combination analgesics, those such as acetaminophen plus aspirin plus caffeine, which is used a lot over the counter by patients, but you know does have established efficacy for migraine. Other migraine specific drugs that are probably efficacious um, one back on the market uh, after having been gone for a while is ergotamine plus caffeine. Um, but then some of the newer, um, well, some of the older medications that we have used, such as DHE, the new ones are the intranasal, uh, but the old ones that I think date back to 1945 when they were first approved was the, you know, parenteral administration. So giving it as either an IM in the IV or subcutaneously, and that's, you know, DHE. And then the nonspecific things that are used are some of the other non-steroidals that are listed here. Uh, Ketorolac, given IM or IV, which is commonly used, particularly in emergency rooms. There's a combination of acetaminophen with either isometheptine or with tramadol or with codeine. Um, IV magnesium, which has been used for migraine with aura. And then anti- emetic drugs. And these are frequently used uh, parenterally in the emergency room, like an IV of metoclopramide or prochlorperazine. Um, but they're anti-nausea medications that also have efficacy in migraine. So, you know, these would be the ones that would be at the top of my list when I'm considering what's appropriate for any given patient. Well, thank you, Gretchen. So Peter, can you explain to our audience the targets of different common classes of treatments and what's important con um, to consider when it comes to contraindications and adverse events that us as clinicians need to really be considerate and aware of when prescribing medications? It's, it is remarkable what's happened to acute migraine therapy in the last maybe year and a half with the, we used to have basic analgesics and triptans. And if you think about ergots is in terms of the uh, serotonin receptor agonism that's here. Now we've got two new classes, very specifically uh, Dychans, the 1F receptor agonist, and uh, G-Pants, the CGRP receptor, small molecule antag uh, antagonists. 
it's it's quite it's quite extraordinary when you think about when you think of Cox drugs and the Cox two drugs and then the working through these uh, these classes. It's a there's a a seriousness to the pharmacology. The downside, of course, is there's a lot more to know. Uh, the upside is there's just so much more you can do uh, than, than we used to do. And it, of course, each of these classes bring their own um, nuances, as you say, in terms of in terms of adverse events. So the things we know and love about non-steroidals, uh, kidney problems or um, or GI uh, GI problems, tryptans, which we've become used to, I think, in the last um, in the last thirty years or so. They're not drugs you give to people with who've got cardioactive uh, cardiovascular disease or poorly controlled hypertension. But you know that that's good medicine. One's going to control those uh, those those sort of things to start with. We've got the ergots, of course, as um, as uh, Dr. Teachin said, DHE has been around since 1945, and um, oral ergotamine since the late 19th century, and uh, it's specifically recommended by the French in 26. So there's nothing new under that sun. We've got with the diatans, um, the particular problem of um, of dizziness that was reported, maybe 15% of patients in the in the clinical trials, this problem of uh, the, uh, the eight-hour driving. Uh, restriction is something that does factor into use when you, when you're discussing it. On the upside, it's a purely neural drug. There's no evidence that 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 the, the diatans affect vessels at all. So there's a there are swings and roundabouts, you might say. And in the middle of that is the G pants, your, your brojapan or emojipan, which from the clinical trials is hard to drag up side effects to find, which sounds ridiculous, but here's what it is. I mean. You could say hypersensitivity to any ingredient to anything, and of course, nausea is the only thing that stands above uh, placebo. So it's re- it's this is a, a rich collection. It's an I see it as an opportunity because it's it's unusual for someone these days to walk in and having had everything from the list, always got a little bit to do. So I find it I, it's daunting. I know, exciting at another level. Yeah, you definitely said it right. Exciting, but sometimes quite daunting as we have so many options. And we are very comfortable with some of these older options now, like triptans have been around such a long time. You know exactly what to expect when you see the patient. But some of these older drugs do have um, quite a, a discontinuation rate. And we know that though we have so many treatment options for patients, sometimes patients will stop using treatments. And this can be true for acute treatments as well. Uh, Gretchen, I wonder if you could talk to us a bit about why patients might stop using their acute migraine treatments. Yeah, there's a variety of reasons. Um, I'd say probably the main one is that they don't feel that it works for them. Um, Sometimes, you know, they take it and their headache does not go away, but it may be that they take it and they get a side effect that is intolerable, you know, either sleepiness, dizziness, nausea, you know, that type of thing. And sometimes it depends on, you know, they may have been prescribed the wrong route of administration. Um, you know, maybe they need a, a, you know, a subcutaneous drug or an intranasal drug, but they're taking it orally, or maybe they're needle phobic. And that's exactly, they don't want a drug that involves a needle. Um, so sometimes, you know, we prescribe for them a route of administration we think might be convenient and actually just for whatever reason, they don't like it. The cost, though, I think is the saddest thing that keeps people sometimes from taking medications. Um, you know, oftentimes because these drugs can be so costly if their insurance companies do not cover them, that they will not use them until they're sure the headache is worthy of it. And oftentimes that means they've waited a while and the headache is pretty severe by the time they start. And with the triptans, that had been a particular issue. Um, You know, the other thing too, is just because of the cost of drugs, oftentimes people will say like, oh, well, if the headache's not too bad, I will take an over-the-counter medication. Um, and you know, that can be okay if it works for them, but oftentimes with certain ones, particularly those that can contain caffeine, you know, the acetaminophen aspirin caffeine combination, they might start taking too many of them and then turn into an overuse situation. Um, sometimes people I've taken care of over many years, they'll be taking a triptan, for instance, they think it works great, and then they develop 
heart disease, not because of the tryptan, but you know, because of their you know, genetic predisposition to it and other uh, risk factors, cardiovascular risk factors that they have, and then they have to stop taking it and they need another medication. And until these lismitidan and the G pants came around, there weren't many options that were migraine specific. Um, and so, you know, we have to always think that they may not have a contraindication when you start them on a medication, but they may develop one later and then the medications have to be changed. And these are all important points about reasons that patients might stop treatment. And you did mention that sometimes efficacy can be a problem in route of administration. And one thing to point out is that route of administration can definitely be a problem for patients to have migraine, especially those that have a significant amount of nausea. So we see this a lot in patients who have severe nausea or have vomiting. They perhaps take a pill and then they don't know if the pill has been effective or if they've maybe threw up the pill. And, and honestly, I'm not sure either. Oh, I took a dissolvable tablet and I threw up 15 minutes later. Do you think it was absorbed? Uh, so I think it's definitely important having non-oral options and actually just viewing some of the questions our audience agrees and is very curious about non-oral options for migraine as well. And in fact, is asking if Peter, have you even heard about maybe this new drug called Zvegepant? Um, and if that's a possible option for patients with migraine. So Peter, could you talk to us a little bit about non-oral migraine treatment options? And if you do know a bit about Zvegepan, if you wanna just throw a line in there about this treatment option as well to answer one of our audience questions. Yeah, for sure. I mean, we've got the list there of ways you can do things non-orally and pretty much now, whatever for all the classes we went through, there are some uh, non-oral options, the DHE sprays that are now coming uh, coming along, as well as injectable dihydroagotamine. There's triptan sprays, uh, sumatriptan and zomitriptan are available as a spray. Um, they they all they have their adherence, you might say. Certainly, sumatriptan injection as um, remains just one of the great uh, reliable treatments you can, you can. You can bank on the absorption. You can also bank on the side effects, which is problematic. Then you've got uh, injections of uh, of non-steroidals. As the question is asking, um, probably seen the press release, Zaveji Pant is the latest of the G pants. The, the hints in the last two syllables, CGRP, small molecule CGRP receptor uh, antagonist, and the phase three studies were just announced by their uh, their uh, the owners, the sponsors, uh, Biohaven. And it's effective against uh, against placebo. They've got good uh, two-hour pain-free um, and most bothersome symptoms, so the standard uh, outcomes. And they reported an earlier study at the American Academy this year. So, in this in this gra in this uh, slide, we'll have another box in perhaps a year's time, which will say G pants, um, and it'll have uh, an int a nasal option because, as you say, some patients this is this is, a, this is an important option, and we mustn't. Have I think here we, we don't want to forget neuromodulation is an entirely different approach to the same question. It's an entirely different approach to tolerability and to things like nausea, uh, uh, the, the um, STMS, VNS, REN, the ETNS, and the combination of superorbital and occipital uh, stimulation, these range of things which don't have any of the disadvantages at all. That we've been talking about. I mean, they have they have their advantages and their, their drawbacks. So neuromodulation, is, I think, is underused. Can be complex because of costs and the logistics around it. But is offering yet another dimension for patients, so we can get a, a really good combination uh, to get uh, in control of their um, of their treatment. Yes, thank you, Peter, and thanks for throwing in the little information about Zvegepan. I do want to just close out the rest of the question that also asked if Remegepan is available as a non-oral. It does, Remegepan is an oral dissolvable tablet, but does not come as a nasal or injectable option. Zvegepan, if it is FDA approved in the future, would be the only non-oral G-Pant um, 
at that point. So let's move on to our second of three learning objectives. And we're going to now look to apply data on efficacy and safety of recently approved therapies for acute treatment of migraine to optimize migraine treatment decisions for our patients with migraine. I think this is very important in clinical practice. So Gretchen, let's go back to Laura. If you could just briefly tell us any updates on Laura at this point. Well, Laura comes back. It's now 18 months later. She's had a baby. Um, she is not currently nursing. So that's one thing that sometimes can complicate, you know, deciding uh, what medication to uh, use on a person. And she's come back because, you know, just having a little one and needing to care for her baby, she doesn't want to be drowsy. And she had found that sumatriptan was fairly effective for her, but it did cause her some drowsiness and she found that she did best when she took it and could lie down for a little while. Um, she's still having her migraine with aura. She hasn't developed any new uh, cardiovascular risk factors. Um, she did have a complication of gestational diabetes during her pregnancy and has the asthma, but she's not on any medications for that. So anyway, um, you know, she's looking for a medication that she can use instead of sumatriptan because she wants to avoid that side effect of drowsiness. Yeah, and before we talk about what we think might be a good idea, let's see what our audience thinks. So what medication class would you recommend for Laura at this time? Would you uh, recommend a Ditan, a Triptan, an NSAID, a G-Pant, or you're not sure? Let's play some of that fun music for you all. All right, Gretchen. So what do you think about these results? Well, I think that, uh, you know, a lot of people came up with, I think, some good answers. You know, the main problem with you know, continuing a triptan for this patient specifically is just that that for her, you know, the drowsiness was a side effect. And I don't know that, you know, just switching to a different triptan would be much of an option. There are some people that do not have that side effect at all. So, you know, it really depends on the patient. Um, the ditans would be one that you probably would not want to go to next, just in that, as we had just mentioned that you know, they have that driving restriction due to both the dizziness and the drowsiness that can come with them that can last a good eight hours. Um, so that might be something that you'd want to avoid in this patient specifically. Non-steroidals can have drowsiness, but um, I think for her, the main problem with them is when she was on ibuprofen, it didn't seem to be particularly effective, but maybe there would be a different one that could be used. But a G-PAN seems like a good answer just because the drowsiness does not seem to be any type of a major side effect uh, with this. So it's not prominent in any of the studies. So I think that that would probably be the one that I would have gone to next. It's remarkable, isn't it, that a year ago, a little bit more, what we would have done is probably discuss how we cycle through different triptans and work out maybe which one was better tolerated. Um, mm -hmm. And 18 months later, we actually have an option that's evidentially better, um, which is not that, not that it would be wrong to say, try almotriptan as an example, if you had sumatriptan, because there's RCT evidence to show it's better tolerated. And so, but the, 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 we, the dimension of things has just gotten better. It's quite exciting like that. that you, can, you, know, you could be right in a number of ways here. And I, I totally agree with you that the G-Pan is the, is, is, is the standout option. Yeah, I, I, I will say, though, there's almost a third of you that weren't sure. And I just have to say, we are very happy that you're here today because yes. we didn't expect you to come in with any kind of answers. So you're right in the right place. We hope that we're going to get you these answers very shortly. So, Gretchen, since we didn't want to keep Laura on a trip to because of the drowsiness, Let's talk a little bit about efficacy of triptans in acute migraine and really uh, take this conversation from there. Could you review some of this information for us? Yes. Yeah, so some of the things that we look for in, you know, looking at what we think, uh, how effective a drug is, and uh, is we want to look at the 
freedom from pain in two hours. So headache relief means that you still have some pain, but you feel like you're somewhat better. Um, and freedom from pain would mean that you're no longer having the headache in two hours. And, you know, with the triptans, you know, there's a wide range of how people respond to them. And, you know, from these different studies, but up to, you know, three quarters of people had some relief at two hours, you know, it ranged from 42 to 78%. But freedom uh, from pain at two hours, you know, was anywhere between 18% and 50%. So if you're at that upper limit, I mean, upper level of a 50%, that means, you know, that's not a bad, you know, particularly for migraine drugs, it's not bad efficacy. Um, but also at 24 hours with the triptans, um, some people had relief that lasted up to 24 hours uh, with them and uh, nearly a third had sustained freedom from pain at 24 hours. Um, and then, you know, the other thing to look at is, did they need to take another medication? They took their triptan and then they needed a rescue medication. And when people use triptans, you know, between 20 and 34% needed a rescue medication, but that's compared to in these studies to over 50% uh, that needed it if they were taking placebo. So, you know, triptans are not a bad drug. And certainly when you um, add them to something like uh, a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug, uh, that can be very effective, uh, you know, for people, maybe more effective than the triptan alone, but that's not going to do anything about the drowsiness, which is our patient, you know, Laura's main complaint about the triptan. So not so much lack of efficacy, but a side effect. Yeah, that's very true. So when we take a look at those triptan studies, when they were initially approved, we've come quite a way with how we've designed clinical trials and some of the new endpoints. And these endpoints apply particularly to these newer products that we're using today. So we thought we'd have a few minutes and really talk about um, the new primary outcomes and the primary outcome measures when it comes to the newer trials that we're looking at today. Peter, could you take us through some of these primary outcome measures and patient reported outcomes? Yes, yeah, so thanks. The, as the slide says, the, the, the baseline, as in migraine with and without or um, over 18, a certain number of attacks um, a month, and with and without preventive medications, not dissimilar to what was happening in the triptan area. Indeed, the age and definition, the ICHD definition of migraine really hasn't changed for since 1988. And so that, that's useful in terms of comparability. What we have, what has emerged is that uh, the co-primary endpoint that the FDA insists on for regulatory purposes is pain freedom, which is, if, you know, that we ever thought that not being free of pain was a good idea is, is complex to think of. So pain freedom, which is clearly a great, is the, is the right outcome. And freedom from their most bothersome symptom. And the way that's defined in all of these trials, and that's helpful because you can, you can slot everything we're saying into this, was that the patient would nominate either nausea, photophobia or phonophobia, so sensitive to light or sensitive to sound, as their most bothersome symptom for that attack and that symptom had to be gone at two hours. And to have a migraine treatment, you have to be, you have to hit both pain freedom and hit the most bothersome symptom. So it, it's uh, that that's been an interesting development. And of course, we've gotten more interested, as we should, in in, in expanding patient reported outcomes, returns to normal function, the patient global impression of change, the use um, of the 24-hour disability scales um, to, to show disability reduced and of course satisfaction scale. So we're looking at the sort of things that you might expect that, patient, that we're actually asking patients in many ways when they, when they come back and you see that data um, bubbling through all of, the new, all of the new studies that we're talking about today. Yeah, and so as we have newer outcomes, we also have a little bit of a better understanding on therapeutic targets. So Peter, could you briefly describe the context, context sorry, of therapeutic targets to us for these newer treatment options in migraine? Yeah, so what you see on the slide, that it is fantastic that um, we now have three clearly established, clear evidence and, and, and regulatory approved and so forth targets for acute migraine. We have triptans, one serotonin 
5-HG1, B1, D receptor agonists, so they turn those receptors on. Uh, DITANs, which are serotonin 1F receptor agonists, and then GPANs, which are CGRP receptor antagonists. The diagram on the right is a little bit detailed, but um, the, the core thing is to remember that the the important pathway, the trigeminovascular system with a vessel and the nerve innervation, what the triptans do is constrict the vessel and block the nerve. And in the central nervous system, they block the nerve. What diatans do is they do nothing to the vessel and they just, they just turn the nerve off. And what CGRP receptor antagonists do is they block, the rele- they block the effect of the release of the CGRP. And I'm sorry to be wiggling in front of my face like that, but the... We, I mean, we've got a really good understanding of the uh, of, of how these medicines work because they're very specific and how they interact with this uh, with this pain system so that, that we can be you know it, it's you know, I think it's useful uh, knowledge at some level because patients can sometimes be interested in why these things are different and in the difference explains much of uh, much of the actually explains all of the sort of things we've been talking about in terms of um, effects and uh, adverse events. Yeah, so these differences are definitely extremely unique and what make these products very special and what lead to how they can fit into the clinical space. And I think, Peter, your excitement, our excitement is definitely driving our audience to ask tons of questions for us. So Gretchen, maybe you could briefly tell us a little bit about what clinicians should take away from the primary efficacy endpoints for Ubro Japan in its primary clinical trials titled Achieve One and Achieve Two. Yeah, so in Achieve One, what they looked at um, was pain-free two hours after the initial dose, and they looked at a 50 milligram dose and a 100 milligram dose. So the lighter blue is a 50, the darker, I guess that's blue, is the um, 100 milligram dose compared to the placebo in the gray. And both were uh, significantly more effective than placebo um, at either of the doses. And what we found was that in pain freedom, it was around, you know, 20%, 21% of people had pain freedom compared to 11% in the placebo. But in the most bothersome symptoms, freedom from that in two hours was, you know, over a third. Um, so that numbers there are like 38.8 and 37.7%. Um, but, you know, placebo didn't do terribly at 27%. Now the Achieve 2, which is another phase three trial, the dose that were used was a little bit smaller that they compared to is a Brojapan 25 and 50 milligram, but they didn't see much difference between the 25 and, and 50. Um, and both of them performed well against placebo. And it was very similar in that, again, it's close to 20% that were pain-free at two hours with the initial dose in um, both the dosage strengths and also at the most bothersome symptom being gone after two hours. And again, it's you know about a third, a little bit more uh, for that endpoint. So I think that's something for people to know that the primary endpoints were achieved, you know, for these three different doses or the three different doses that they studied. Yeah, it's interesting. It's probably why they called it achieve, right? All these fancy names they come up with for these clinical trials. So Peter, I think, uh, you know, this next uh, slide brings up an important point because we're, we're going to get asked this in the question part about triptans versus GPANs. And we're naturally are going to prescribe GPANs in patients who tried triptans before. So tell us a little bit about this post hoc analysis of you bro Japan in patients who've tried triptans or maybe weren't able to try triptans before. Yeah, so what, uh, what we did, and Andy Blumenfeld is the first uh, author on this study, it's published in Headache, was to look at the, um, the, uh, reg- the, the phase three studies that uh, Gretchen's just uh, spoken about and do what you do, what you're going to do when someone walks into the room who you see. Have you had a triptan before? Triptan naive. If you had a triptan, did it work? Your responder. Or was it insufficient? Were you not, or were you not satisfied with it in some way? You were non-responder either in terms, of particularly uh, in efficacy terms. And what you see across here is that there's no difference when you look at the treatment by uh, by uh, subgroup interaction, that is, 
naive responder or insufficient responder between the tryptan naive, the tryptan responder, and the tryptan um, insufficient responder group. That is to say that when someone walks in and says that they've had a tryptan and it wasn't any good for them, they're just as likely to respond to, um, to Ubrogipan as a person who walked in the door and hasn't had either a tryptan or Ubrogipan. So the it's important in clinical practice to be able to say with a very straight face to a patient that if they've had a, not a great response with the medicine before, that actually there's a very reasonable chance that they're going to get an effect from the new therapy. I think it's very reassuring to have data like this. Thank you, Peter. So now let's talk about another GPAN called Remigipan. Gretchen, what can you share about the medication and this particular data over the next two slides? Okay, so in this first slide with Remigipan, we're looking at the same primary endpoints that were looked at on the Abrojapan ACHIEVE trials and uh, for Remigipan. So that means the pain freedom two hours after the initial dose and the doses that this is data for 75 milligram oral dissolving, uh, dissolvable tablet. And then the most bothersome symptom freedom two hours after the initial dose. And, you know, the data looks very similar to what we had seen on the other slide, as far as about, you know, 20, or it's 21% of people were pain-free, uh, which was about twice uh, the placebo group. And then we're again, just over a third, I think it's 35% here we see uh, for freedom from the most bothersome symptom and significantly better than the placebo. So then the next slide is looking at Remagepant in the same dose, the 75 milligram dose, but instead of it being the oral dissolvable tablet, it's with the oral tablet that would be swallowed, um, you know, whole and then, uh, you know, processed in the GI system. And here the data looks very similar, both for pain freedom at, uh, you know, two hours where it's almost 20%. And with the uh, uh, most bothersome symptom at two hours, which again is uh, over a third, it's 37.6%. Both of these results for these primary endpoints are significantly uh, better um, at reaching them than the people that were on the placebo. All right, great. So we talked all earlier about another category of medications called DITANs. There's only a single agent in this category called lesmitidan. And remember that Peter had told us that this is primarily more a centrally acting drug and has no effects on the blood vessels. Very, very exciting stuff, as you can imagine. So Peter, why don't you take us through this data here about efficacy endpoints and what does the clinical trial results show us about lesmitidan? Yeah, so these are the Spartan and Samurai studies, as you, uh, as as you know, they're creatively named. The and and the data, are the pain-free and most bothersome symptom outcome, as 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 we've described, significant across the doses: 50, 100, 200 milligrams in Spartan and 100 and 200 milligrams in um, in in Samurai. So very, it's. And this is two, these are the two phase three studies. There are actually two phase two studies that were positive as well. So altogether, there are four randomized um, parallel group placebo controlled trials that it would show that clearly demonstrate that lesmitidine is effective as an acute migraine agent. And that, that says two things. It's firstly, it says that there's a drug that that does not do anything to blood vessels and is effective in migraine. And sort of, and so when you're thinking about migraine, it really says. Think about uh, think about the neural mechanisms. I, I find it's a very comfortable drug to discuss with people who've where they're where you're nervous about something going on on the cerebrovascular on the cardiovascular side, I should say, um, because this these drugs just don't um, act and uh, act on blood vessels at all. Very clear. Yeah, and I think you know I've you and I have discussed this before, and I always keep this in mind with a patient who I'm the most concerned about with vascular issues that, you know, I will consider this first for those patients mm. because of the, probably it is the safest 
for a vascular patient as it does nothing to the blood vessels. Mm -hmm. So we have talked about several migraine specific acute treatment options. We have our older medications, ergots, DHE and triptans, which we briefly mentioned. And then our newer medications, two GPANs, ubrojapan and remijapan, and one dietan, lasmitidan. So that's a total of five migraine specific acute treatment options, really exciting stuff. But as Peter kind of hinted to, can be a bit overwhelming in clinic. So how do you decide between a tried and true and maybe a newer medication for a patient? So there are some uh, consensus statements that can help us think through when is it time to pull out a new treatment option for a patient in clinic versus using something that's been around a little bit longer. Of course, in the end, the decision should always be the right decision for you and your patient in front of you. But this is something that we will use sometimes to kind of get us through clinic. You want to take a look at an adult patient because these newer treatments at this time have only been FDA approved and are indicated for adults. Uh, there are studies ongoing in pediatric populations, but they aren't completed or really close to completion at this time. You want to think about them in patients who have contraindications or intolerance to triptans. And you want to think about them in patients who've tried two or more oral triptans and have found them to be not working well, and this is either they've told you and you've documented that, or you had them do some kind of validated treatment questionnaire like the MTOC, which can be found online. I usually find just asking the patient in clinical practice, was it effective? And if not, why? Did you have side effects? Did it take too long to work? Did the attack come back? Were you just not satisfied with the treatment? Simple enough things that you can jot down in the clinical note, and um, that serves as purpose for deciding to move on to a different treatment option. So now let's move on to our final learning objective, where we're going to think about implementing patient-centered approaches to individualized treatment strategies for patients with migraine. So Peter, could you tell us a little bit more about patient reported outcomes or what are known as PRO questionnaires? Yes, the, the, some of them are listed, some of the more popular ones are listed on this slide. The idea of the patient reported outcome is what it says on the jar. Patients report the outcome, which is pretty much everything that's going on in migraine. These are validated. The MTOC one that Richard Lipton developed is, was listed first. And I have to say, if I have to use one, it's the one that I use. Migraine assessment of current therapy is what you might expect. Patient perception of a migraine questionnaire and, fun and a functional impairment, um, functional impairment scale. The, I mean, I, I ask patients when they come back, more or less, how's it going? Um, is it useful or not? Get, try to get some a global impression of what's going on. And patient global impressions actually track very well with any of the um, PROs that uh, that I'm talking about. Some of the utility of this can be to document uh, what's going on if you're getting a little bit of a um, rough ride from insurance companies, for example, having something that's validated, published, and say, and you know says what it does on the jar, how to optimize migraine treatment can be useful when you're when you're trying to support and support getting a new medicine. And sometimes they're useful in terms of communications. I, I have to agree with that. I think in clinical practice, you know, the one thing we don't want to come across is saying that you have to use all these questionnaires, which can overwhelm a clinical practice. But I simply just ask the patient how you're doing and do you think your migraine treatment is working satisfactorily for you? And I find that really gets me to the root of the answer very, very quickly. But say you really don't have any time at all. Some of these questionnaires can be done in the waiting room before you even enter, and that can be very nice and easy for you, or you're getting trouble with the insurance company, then having one of these scales can be helpful, kind of getting that next step treatment um, for your patient. So we usually rarely will use one of these scales, but it is really nice to know they exist, and they're starting to make their way onto labels for patient medications, which I think is really important. So Gretchen, I'd wonder if you could um, quickly take us through treatment considerations that you might be making with patients when it comes to perhaps um, not necessarily using uh, pharmacological treatments, but also when you would consider non-pharmacological treatments. Well, I think with a patient, and you could take the patient, Laura, for instance, I mean, she's just using acute therapy. And, um, you know, if that's all a person needs, that's great. But the question sometimes becomes, you know, if they come in and they want something different or something that works better, 
Um, it may be that they're starting to take too much of it. So I think the first thing you want to address with somebody on an as needed medicine is how often are you needing it? Um, because sometimes people, you know, skip over that um, thinking that, you know, they're taking it exactly as prescribed and not realizing that the headaches are getting more frequent and they're taking more of it. So I think, you know, trying to avoid medication overuse by, you know, keeping track of how much the patient is taking and asking them, you know, if it's effective. Um, and I think then the next thing would be is, you know, if they are taking it quite frequently, is it just because it doesn't work or, you know, do they actually need to have a preventive added to their regimen? And preventive could be a preventive medication, because there's certainly a number of those, but it could also be, um, you know, another type of non-pharmacologic therapy, for instance, um, you know, cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, some of these, you know, behavioral therapies have been good for prevention um, and changing lifestyle and some of the other non-pharmacologic things can help both acutely and also as, you know, preventive uh, for patients in trying to keep the number of headaches down. And I think the, the hardest thing about migraine in general is when it comes to either medications or other therapies, how people respond to drugs um, and how many of them, you know, what they can tolerate before they really want to go to a preventive, you know, just varies a lot from person to person. And, you know, they, we have to, it's great when we have meds that are efficacious because I think people feel less like uh, a guinea pig and, you know, there's less trial and error with finding something that works for them, hopefully, um, you know, with more and more effective medications. But I think keeping track of how much they're taking is really probably the first question I would address in somebody who's just on an acute medication. I will say, um, as we're going to talk a little bit about lifestyle changes, um, before getting to that, one unique thing about the G-Pants that has been really nice is not having to necessarily track and sometimes being able to allow the patient to even flex up how often they're using a G-Pant now that Remigipan is used for acute treatment of migraine, but also recently has received FDA approval for preventive treatment of migraine. And some of these patients that fall on that cusp of having you know, enough migraines that they need prevention, but are hesitant about starting a medication for prevention are happy to take their remegipant for acute treatment, allowing them to take it more often and then starting to broach the idea of every other day use. I find that the patients, some particular patients are very comfortable with this because they know that medicine that they've been using mm -hmm. for as needed and feel comfortable with it. Whereas others are very comfortable with neuromodulation, not thinking of it as a preventive treatment option. So sometimes it's also phrasing and just changing their perspective. But I, I agree, a lot of it is their comfort with something and side effects. It really shows us how much harm has been done from some of the prior treatments and, and a lot of the side effects, even though they could have been very beneficial for patients. So um, Gretchen, you briefly mentioned non-pharmacological, and, and I wonder if you could just very quickly mention what are Top line, what do we do for non-pharmacological treatments for patients? What are some of the lifestyle modifications we might mention to patients who have migraine? Yes, I think that, you know, given that there is certainly a connection between sleep and migraine, and, you know, we know acutely that sleeping or taking a nap can sometimes actually even turn off the migraine mechanism, um, and being tired or oversleeping can trigger a migraine. I think that, uh, you know, going through sleeping, eating, exercise, you know, having them keep a diary of the things that they need to track and uh, get, you know, stress controlled are some of the things that, you know, we can start to look at. So, you know, dietary triggers can be different for everyone. Some people can never identify any one. Some people have many, but things like Alcohol, I think, is probably the, the best known one. Many people with migraine don't drink at all because, you know, they find it triggers headaches. Caffeine is a harder one because in some of the medications uh, that are over the counter, caffeine is in them. You know, the acetaminophen 
aspirin and caffeine is widely used. Um, and it's been in some of the migraine medicines like the caffeine and ergotamine, but it can help acutely, but it can sometimes trigger attacks in people if they overuse it. Um, and so that's something that sometimes has to be discussed with a patient. Um, MSG, which there are fewer and fewer things containing it now, are people watching for it. Aspartame, which is in a lot of uh, you know diet products, including diet sodas, uh, for some people they're very sensitive to those. Um, and skipping meals, something as simple as skipping meal can sometimes trigger headaches. And then there are other things that are less easy to control, you know, menstrual periods, uh, being subjected to odors that trigger headaches, you know, sometimes they're noxious fumes, but in other times I've had patients where they just smell citrus and they'll get a headache. So, you know, that can vary from person to person, weather changes, um, you know, certainly have been associated with triggering migraine for some people, um, sleep, um, having sleep apnea, uh, or insomnia can be, um, you know, a detriment in a person with migraine headaches. Exercise, they may not feel like exercising when they have a headache, that might make it worse, or in some cases triggers, but when people get regular exercise, uh, that can oftentimes make them feel better, sleep better, and have fewer migraines. And then I think the one that is really very important is stress. And, you know, there's a lot of stressors people have in their lives, and they can't always get rid of all of those, but if they can uh, learn techniques to control their stress, to manage their stress so that it doesn't have a detrimental effect as such as triggering headaches, I think that's very important. And that's where things like you know, um, exercise or meditation, yoga, tai chi, uh, the cognitive behavioral therapies, you know, all these things have sort of been related to decreasing uh, stress and potentially that may be the mechanism by which they decrease migraine. Yeah. So we talked a lot about triggers. There's only a few ways to capture triggers. Peter, why don't you talk to us a bit about headache diaries? And diaries can be, as you say, used to capture, try to capture triggers. Diaries are probably, they're, they've become more important as you talk about if you talk about prevention, because it's very for, for for many patients, it's important to be able to um, document what's going what's going on. Patients can use diaries that are paper based as an illustration of one, and it can, it can be as simple as marking whether you have a headache or not, and a sort of X for when you have a headache and a and a zero when you took something. Or simple things like that. The degree to which they keep the diary is a little bit a personal thing. I don't like to make diaries a um, a form of punishment for patients or a, a, a drudge, and of course there are the um, there are the apps uh, apps like Migraine Buddy is one that I'm pretty familiar with. Some patients like that like those. I I think it's useful to know, uh, as Gretchen said, um, particularly for people who are taking, uh, um, particularly in the acute side, how often they're they're using acute medicines and have some sort of diary for that. I find it I find it useful to get the overall an overall impression, and I really think that it's important that you let the diary you tailor the diary a little bit to the individual sitting in front of you. There are people sitting in front of you who want to write down ten things about their headache every day. Let them, and there are people who don't want to write too much. Let them do that as well. So long as you get the overall load and the overall impression of what's going on, how they respond and so forth. I, I don't. I think one needs to be flexible and listen to sort of feel what what's useful to the individual sitting in front of you. That's a very good point. So now we have covered quite a lot of ground, and we're going to get to the last question to all of you before you get to ask us more questions. So let's ask how you guys have been doing here. Which of the following is the primary endpoint? Oh, you have to be paying attention here. Of the phase three clinical trials for recently approved lasmitidan, remigipan, or ubroge, and ubrogepan, sorry. Freedom from pain at half an hour, freedom from pain and most bothersome symptom at two hours, resolution of photophobia and phonophobia at one hour, freedom from pain and nausea at four hours, 
or I'm not sure. Remember, this is the end, so don't answer, I'm not sure. That's a good <laughs> <question>. <laughs>
fast forward five years and I'll have egg on my face. <laughs> yeah. But the, I'm happy to I'm happy to do that. I'm happy to do that. But I am struck by the fact that that or the the clinical trials with the, all the GPANs and of course the monoclonal antibodies, at CGRP monoclonal antibody prevention, all 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 are at the same pathway. And yeah. people don't get worse. They they get better or they or nothing um, happens. So I'm optimistic about um about GPAN. It's pretty exciting, it has to be said, that we could have a conversation where we seriously think it's possible that you could have an acute medicine that also acts as a preventive and doesn't cause a problem. Yeah. You know, of course, we did have that a little bit with the focal prophylaxis with the triptans around the menstrual cycle, for instance. Oh. Um, you know, and some people, and I know cluster headache patients, you know, found that they could take a lot of them and wouldn't yeah. get the rebound headache. But uh, it's good to know if, you know, pharmacologically, it looks like from preclinical data, the G-pants, um, you know, that's not going to be the, the issue that we have to wrestle with. So, so there are some, um, just to stay around that topic of G-pants and prevention, medication overuse. So, you know, the theory clinically has been so far is that as some of the blocking of CGRP receptors, like the CGRP monoclonal antibody arenumab, and then coming further with the data on remigipant from their long-term safety study, where they were using up to 15 doses a month, there was suggestion that remigipant didn't cause medication overuse headache, and perhaps this was a class effect. There's older trials from tel um, telcagipant where use frequently reduced migraine instead of and did not cause medication overuse headache. And then RIP in Japan was studied and found to be effective as a preventive treatment. Uh, there's a question of if Remegipant's approved as a preventive and acute, do we think other GPANs would work as a preventive? And any um, information we can share about a Togepan, I would say just to add on that, just to make the picture complete, if we know a Togepan works as preventive, do we think Ubrojapant could work as a preventive? And then there is someone asking, well, if a Togepant works as a preventive, can it work as an acute? So we have an extremely intelligent audience members, I have to say, because they already got their self thinking about, huh, this class can work as both. So can we just throw them all in there? Um, so Peter, I, I would, I'd love to hear your comments on this. Well, I'm taking Coles to Newcastle, as they say, in some parts of the world to tell you as first author of the primary of the largest paper on ATO Japan as a preventive, that it works as a preventive. Um, so you could comment, about, I'll throw that back to you at some point. It's, a, I mean, I, I think it is, the audience is right. This is a very disruptive um, class of medicines where it's probably true that if you gave you Japan at the appropriate interval, and I'm not recommending this, this is not part of the, um, this is not in the, uh, in the PI. This is very this off is label. Not FDA approved, no, right? no, no. But you're asking the mechanistic question. If you gave the intervals appro if appropriately for its half life, I'd expect it to have a preventive effect. And if a toji pant was absorbed fast enough, I'd expect it to have an acute effect. I think the way the, the way that the G pants are used is really driven by their pharmacokinetics. So what's their half life? Um, and how rapidly are they absorbed? And that's really, you, you, you know, Atojapan has an 11-hour half-life. You can give it once a day. That makes it really useful for prevention. Ubrojapan is shorter. I think we're going to see really troublesome, um, the really troublesome development of, of a need to think about these things fle uh, flexibly, as, uh, flexibly as time goes on. Yeah, I, and I, I think that can be troublesome in the sense that we have very rigid ideas right now. Yes. And so we're going to have to rethink our ideas, but I do think that is beautiful for the patients yes. and actually much easier for your primary care providers and your general neurologists because at some point, the hope is as this keeps going, some of these lines can be blurred. It's a much easier conversation. So again, sticking to medication overuse headache, because we didn't quite finish the answer there because the truth is, who knows? Uh, you're on the right track with your thought process. And there isn't data to quite answer, is a Togepant also useful as an acute treatment? We don't know. The trial shows us that it can be effective as soon as the first day. Mm -hmm. Does that mean that's prevent effect or acute treatment effect? We don't really know. Uh, and just like Peter said, Ubrojapan has never been looked at as a preventive treatment, um, but it's, you know, it, 
who knows if it could be effective if used very frequently, but I think dose regimen wise would be difficult for a patient. Um, now let's talk about- It's just one factors. of the small, th yeah. it's just one of the small thing. I mean, it, there's a study published in JAMA recently, um, the Paul Wynn is the first author, the relief study of eptinizumab yes. given intravenously as an acute treatment. And it hit those two endpoints that we had the test on, yep. pain-free at two hours and most bothersome symptom beating placebo. So if you took that data and you just applied the FDA standard, it's not got a license for this, but if you just applied the FDA standard, you would say it could be used for acute treatment. One time. Well, I mean, One time so I don't think, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I th it's a, but it's licensed as a preventive. So I don't think we're drinking from the Kool-Aid to say that um, this is, a, th there's a lot of broad, this is very broad and it's a, the data, all the data coming out is supporting what we're saying. Yeah. And it's, super exciting you know the relief study was a very good thing to bring up is very exciting just to show preventive treatment can work as soon as a few hours during a migraine attack because someone who's experiencing a migraine could get better immediately and then have benefit because some of the subgroup analysis they're going to be looking at is how long does that benefit last but potentially could have benefit lasting out for three months that is pretty spectacular um so Let's talk about risk factors for medication overuse headache. A question from the audience. Are there any particular risk factors for medication overuse headache? And um, another, I think a risk factor, um, but a question is why not putalbital? Why is it no longer considered a good option for treatment for migraine? So I think those two go together. Um, I don't know, Gretchen, if you uh, wanted to talk about this a bit. Well, the medication overuse, you know, the thing that is, uh, you know, some of the risk factors are the things, some of them are obvious things such as, um, you know, the medication, the acute medications are ineffective. And so people take more of them, but they did, I think the Hunt study, the Norwegians did where they followed patients for like 11 years, looking at development of medication overuse headache. They found some things such as uh, higher levels of depression and anxiety. I know I've had patients that are anxious and they take the medicine even before they need it because they're worried that they're gonna get a headache. There's a lot of symptoms people get in between headaches. Um, and also when they had musculoskeletal complaints um, or other pain conditions, they tended to have a higher risk of overusing medications um, I think the other things are in that study, it was something like, um, physical inactivity and smoking and, you know, some other things that aren't really very healthy, uh, habits to have put them at higher risk. And it's not necessarily causation, but, uh, those were things that were associated with it. So maybe some of these are just people that are less healthy to begin with at our higher risk of overusing medication, but particularly when they have other pain conditions or anxiety, I think those are certainly things that put people um, at, at risk of overusing medicine. With regards to butalbital, I mean, we know it's not very specific. It can be somewhat sedating. It does have a tendency to get overused. I mean, I would say that if there was any medication, I hated to see a patient come in on, it was one of these butabital combination drugs um, because they were frequently taking way too many and it's not always easy to get off of it. Um, you know, those that is a, has some addictive potential and uh, people can sometimes have some withdrawal side effects from it. So it's not that it has no benefit, but in some countries, like I believe in Germany and stuff, they've totally like taken it off the market. Um, it's still available in the U.S. and, you know, it has been used here, certainly um, primarily in primary care clinics, I think more than now than in specialty clinics, because we do have a lot of other options. But, um, you know, that, that drug does have some problematic side effects to it. Yeah, thank you. When you look at the population, uh, the, the work that Lipton did some years ago, the, 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 le the frequency of intake of uh, as compared to anything else, including opioids, is about a third. Um, so it's about f after once you get to about four days, well, once you get to four days a month, that that um, predicts the increased frequency in the following year compared to um, ten days for uh, for for an opioid. So it's 
you've got a much narrower margin of um, safety, if you want to think about it that way, in terms of promoting um, worsening of headache. They're, they're difficult drugs to use in, in any way you look at them, and they're sedating. And, yeah, you know, they're difficult to stop using patients. Some, yes, some patients have a lot of yeah, problems with yeah, it. And yeah. You have to be more careful, you know, than you would even probably with an opiate uh, in just yes. stopping it yes. because of yes. the, the potential for seizures and stuff yeah. during withdrawal. So I don't, I don't like them too much. All right, great. Thank you both for your answers. I wanted to quickly take a stab at two of the questions to answer them um, before handing you guys off one more question. Uh, there's a quick question about these new therapies, GPANS and DITANS in women who are pregnant and currently they're not recommended um, because of potential safety pregnant in pregnancy and in lactation. So we will usually hold off on these medications. Um, another question that two that are linked are asking about newer options and insurance coverage, and do we usually start with triptans first? Most insurance policies will require that patients have, have tried at least two, sometimes three triptans before moving on to newer treatment options like G pants and ditans. So we do, I would recommend checking in with insurance policies, but most of these treatments are now on insurance coverage for most commercial and um, mostly for Medicare as well. Important thing to note for some government plans that one, insurance does vary from state to state, so you have to check in with your local policies. And two, that with government plans, sometimes if the patient doesn't have a secondary insurance, even though that might be covered, there might be a high copay and they can't use these coupons, so that can definitely be an issue. Um, and then one quick thing, someone asked if you can overuse a device and that can cause a problem. I would say no, except I did have a patient once uh, overuse the superorbital nerve stimulator, which is a question that's come up and they did develop a little bit more frequent migraines. So I always tell them, use it as it's directed um, and try not to use it more often than that. And so be, the last Jessica, question- Just before, yes. would it be fair to say that, I mean, I think we're not trying to trash triptans. Um, no because they're, they're good drugs. They've been used in tens of millions of people. We know what their problems are because we know what their problems are and they've been used for 30 years. What I think we're trying to emphasize is that we have now choices when there are problems, choices and options. So it's not like it's trip trip ten trash time, it's expansion and options for therapy and it's good for patients. So I wouldn't want people to walk away with the questions thinking that, you know, we think the trip tan should be thrown out. I, I don't think that for a moment. No, no, it's actually, yes, Peter, excellent point. And thank you for bringing that up. It's, they're still a first line because yeah. they're effective, but another question was, is it required also by insurance? Yeah. And, and it is a requirement as well. Yeah. And the American Headache Society, you know, they had recently published a paper, you know, mentioning using, you know, starting with things like migraine specific drugs, like the triptans before going on to the other ones. And, you know, it's always a question of, is that just purely based on economics of it? Uh, you know, since the newer drugs work very well as well. And, you know, it, it is really a balancing act in part, but it's more, I think it's more than just the economics of starting with the triptan in that, you know, there is a long-term safety data on those. And I think there's nothing wrong with trying them first, you know, because in many cases they are very effective, so. Yeah, so last question I wanted to throw to both of you before uh, we end the program is a comment on GPANT dosing. And I will say this is very specific to Ubrojapant as Remigipant only has a single dose of 75 milligrams, one tablet once in a day. So for Ubrojapant, there's two dose options. Which dose do you start at? If the migraine pain is not re resolved, do you increase the dose or do you change um, out of the class or swap to a different medication? And how long do you wait before changing the treatment option? I'm going to guess that means how many migraine attacks do you treat before changing to a different treatment? So um, Peter, if you wanted to take this first. Yeah, sure, thanks. I, I think of um, migraine treatment as the long game. So I, I start with the uh, lowest dose I can and if I get an effect, I'm happy. And if I don't, I'll raise it. So when the Ubrojipan comes in 50 and 100, I'll start with 50. I'll give them uh, two attacks, three if they're not too sure. 
and then ask and then ask the question whether it's useful or not. And if it's not useful, I'll increase the I'd in, increase to a hundred. I, I wouldn't get into a pitch battle with someone who wants to start with a hundred and see what happens. It's just a it, little bit's a question of who's sitting in front of you. There are patients who who want to run over the road before they look both ways. And there are people <laughs> who want to look both ways five times before they cross the road. And I think one of the nice things about having those choices is you can have that discussion with the person, you know, what are you really, what, what's the thing that worries you the most about the next thing I'm about to do? So if you make that connection, you don't really have to take this decision. The person will take it for you and then it will be the right decision because it's the thing that they um, want to do. So I, I, while I'm a low dose person, if someone wants to, run it straight up the mass pole, there's no particularly bad. I don't think that's a bad thing. All right, so I think we're pretty much out of time. I wanted to encourage our audience members to visit the Migraine Education Hub for additional information, clinical guidance, clinical guidelines, resources, and patient education about migraine. And to receive CME credit for today's activities, participants must complete the post-test and evaluation online. So you wanna click on the request credit tab to complete the process and print your certificate. So thank you again for participating and for providing the best care that you can for your patients with migraine and to think about acute treatment options. I'd also like to thank both Peter and Gretchen for joining me today and this absolutely fantastic discussion that we've been having.